been challenges with uh, the client. My uh, my video is not uh, not working at the moment. Okay, can you share your uh, screen? Yep, that should be fine. Here we go. We see your screen. You can hide the little bar. Okay. Yeah, exactly. At least we hear you. We see your screen. The stage Excellent. is yours. Then uh, I'll take it away. Thanks for the introduction. So today we're here to talk about the journey we had of discovering API version differences and our challenges that we uh, that we had in this space. So before I dive into that, I'll give a bit of a background so you know have get a bit of an idea of what kind of questions you can ask. Uh, ask of me and where I come from. So uh, I'm a developer advocate. I work for a company called uh, called Lubic. We do. We are in the backup and cloud uh, cloud data management sphere. And I am going to cover today what kind of IPA uh, API we are uh, we are working with, what kind of challenges uh, we get into, how we solve these challenges using uh, using tooling. And then at the end, we're going to leave some time for uh, for Q and A. So the use case for uh, our API, already briefly touched on it, is uh, backup, but also cloud data management, uh, disaster, disaster recovery, uh, and anomaly detection, and other kind of uh, other kind of scenarios. So before I go too deep into uh, the issues we had, I'll talk a bit about how our API is structured. And then based on that, uh, I'll set the premise for uh, how we solved our, uh, our issues there. So because we are using uh, API, API first design, uh, what we've done is we, uh, our, uh, our internal calls are also uh, API calls. So for us, the same logic applies whenever we're either using our UI or when we're using uh, plugins or SDKs or different kind of uh, different kind of automation tools. We're we're all on top of the same uh, same API endpoint, so there's no uh, no difference there. Um, we our product also consumes third party APIs. So uh, whenever we work with uh, one of the big cloud providers, whether it be uh, Amazon, Azure, or GCP, we consume their APIs. Uh, we automatically generate our documentation, so it makes it easy for people to get into that. And then our challenge uh, is that we we version our. Um, uh, our different API endpoints under internal v1, v2. And whenever we go from uh, from internal to v1 or v1 to v2, uh, the original endpoints also, uh, also stay in place. So why this is important, I'll get to in a little bit. We also have a GraphQL endpoint, uh, but we won't be covering that in this session because I only have uh, 20 minutes for this, so I'll leave that one out of scope for uh, for what we've uh, put together. So then, obviously, I need an excuse to get some animals uh, into my slide. So we have a couple of different uh, different users of our uh, of our product, and uh, uh, because of that, also uh, different uh, different types of uh, uh, different types of people touching our APIs. So uh, we have the end users, which are, are on the left. Our end users are just very happy to go along for the guide, and they just want to get to where they need to go. And we have the developers who are very familiar with API calls and are just happy to consume API documentation and based on that, uh, write their own software or their own integrations around that. And then on the right, I really want to have a quaka in my, uh, in my slide. So Quaka is just happy as long as there's checkboxes for all the capabilities that are uh, that are there. So how does this actually relate to uh, what we have? So uh, we obviously have uh, the API Playground uh, or API Explorer that we can uh, that we can use. Uh, 
we fully support browser and desktop tools. So Chrome developer tools or Postman is obviously more for, uh, for the developer side of things. Then we also have abstraction layers built on top of uh, our APIs. So in case you're not familiar with these languages, it's uh, PowerShell, Python, and Golang. And also we have the integrations uh, on top of that. So Ansible or Terraform are two, uh, two prime examples of that. So when we get to the level of automation tools, then you would be on the level of the end users. This is what an end user might be using. They don't really care that your product is utilizing APIs under the hood. They just want to use their favorite product or their favorite uh, their favorite programming language in order to be able to uh, to get the job done and to set the configuration or get the data that they are uh, they are after. And then we also have uh, plugins for uh, either popular uh, service management uh, portals or logging uh, logging tools. So our challenge here is that we have quite a big ecosystem of, uh, of different products. And because of, this, uh, because of this big ecosystem with SDKs and integrations, whenever there's going to be changes to API endpoints or uh, in the order of a that API endpoints are being called in, uh, we don't... Uh, we didn't have a direct way to be able to identify that. And the solution to this problem can also be just wait and see what happens, wait for uh, for people to complain, wait for GitHub issues to pile up for all the things that uh, doesn't work. But we were looking for uh, a more proactive, uh, proactive approach. So the initial way of uh, going about this was going to the change logs and Taking a look at our change logs and based on that, see what needs to uh, needs to change. This uh, is a solid solution, but there's a couple of uh, couple of issues with that. If we look in the bottom right corner, we can see that there's uh, the the change logs for our APIs are quite quite large. In this case, it was 1700, uh, 1700 pages. If I printed it to uh, to a PDF. And another challenge with this is that it's uh, it's only displaying the changes from the previous version. So if you want to know what changed uh, with two versions ago or even three versions ago, you have to read to all the change logs and then uh, make the determination of what changed and what will actually affect you based on uh, based on that. So reading the change logs was not a great, uh, great way of uh, approaching this problem because it also it takes a lot of time, a lot of manual, uh, manual effort. But also because there might be different product versions, uh, not everyone upgrading from the latest version to the newest version, and then also we're using a lot of different downstream languages and integrations. And whenever new functionality is introduced, uh, it will be uh, it will be available in the change log. But once again, if you're going over multiple versions, and one of the downstream languages hasn't been updated for a couple of months, it starts to become challenging to find out what functionality needs to be added and uh, how to uh, how to approach that. So, what is our goal here? So, for us, our goal was to. Uh, to get the tooling in place to help us uh, to help us determine what will break before uh, before a new version of our uh, of our API uh, hits the market. So there's a couple of things that uh, that I needed, and I'm also uh, the end user of this uh, of this product. So I wanted uh, initially just to be able to get a report on different. Uh, on the differences from one version uh, from one version to another, and the most important uh, most important data point for us is of course breaking changes because we don't want to get uh, piled on with GitHub issues that our SDKs or our integrations are no longer working because of a breaking change that we missed because we didn't feel like reading to a change log of a couple a couple dozens of pages. Another 
another uh, issue that we faced was that endpoints could actually move. That is why I showed uh, the overview of our uh, of our structure of API endpoints because an endpoint might move from internal, which is uh, before it's uh, officially released, to v1. So if an endpoint moves, the functionality might not uh, might not have changed, but it's now uh, it's now listed under v1 instead of uh, instead of internal. So whenever something like that happens, we want to take action on that because a it's a quick fix and b it doesn't look good if our SDKs are not uh, not up to spec with uh, with newer versions. And then uh, aside from the breaking changes, there's also changes in our APIs that might not immediately break things, but it might break the logic uh, that someone might be using in uh, in their script. So if there are changes in the status code or in the uh, in the body or some parameters are used to be mandatory or, or were not mandatory and became mandatory. Those are kind of things that uh, are important for us to know when we're maintaining our SDKs. And based on that, uh, if we have this report on the differences in versions, uh, we would like to create a report for uh, for an SDK to to see what lines of code we actually need to change. So in the case of uh, in case of a breaking change, if we know the endpoint, we can uh, we can pinpoint uh, which lines of code we need to change and what needs to be changed because. We already have the report on the different version differences, and we can then apply this by uh, by scanning our code. So, the initial uh, the initial uh, setup we were using, we just use a regular expression. We look for the endpoints, uh, but depending on which uh, which SDK we're working on, we have a bit more uh, advanced using the AST to uh, parse to our scripts to determine if it is actually broken, because sometimes there might be uh, there might be, for example, commented out code of old endpoints in there, and that obviously doesn't need to change. So what we've put together is the following. So uh, we created a comparison framework. So this framework uh, takes all the open IP, uh, API specs. So we take the Swagger definitions. Uh, we can compare any version uh, of our API to any uh, version in the past or a newer version. Uh, once we generate this report using the comparison framework, uh, we can uh, we can apply what we find there to all the different SDKs and integrations, and then either generate a report there or uh, even automatically update the code. I have to say that we are uh, currently not yet at the point where we can just uh, automatically rewrite our code, because there are uh, there are a lot of considerations that uh, that I've gone into when whenever we uh, try to automatically generate our code, that things would no longer work uh, as expected. And then to uh, make life easier, of course, GitHub. Uh, Everyone's favorite, uh, everyone's favorite uh, code sharing versioning uh, platform. Uh, we automatically generate uh, the issues there. So if we did an analysis on an SDK and we find, okay, either this is a breaking change or this is new functionality that doesn't exist yet, and we find it important enough to to raise an issue, either a bug report or an enhancement request, we can automatically raise that to GitHub. So it's visible uh, not just to ourselves, but also for other people. So if something is going to uh, uh, be required or uh, uh, be considered a bug report, uh, we can uh, preemptively already raise these issues and then have it picked up uh, as quickly as possible. And then our second piece of output is the, the different reports. So. Uh, obviously, that's going to be the report for just the differences in the Swagger definition, but also a report specific to an integration or an SDK. So what we've learned here, um, the biggest one was uh, change logs are not a lot of fun. 
Uh, a single change log is not that much, uh, not that much of an issue because reading a single change log it will provide a lot of information. Our change logs are are quite extensive. That's why there's all, always uh, that many pages as well. Uh, but it doesn't really scale well if you go over multiple versions or even when you go from one major version to another major version, uh, then you'll have to take into account all the minor uh, the, the minor version change logs as well. And that uh, very quickly becomes, uh, it becomes hard to determine which are the breaking changes and what is the new functionality. Uh, the automation has been a lot of fun because um, this was the kind of automation that actually brought a direct benefit uh, to our teams. So uh, aside from uh, enjoying, uh, enjoying to build the tools, it also had an immediate benefit for us because it actually made our job easier and it took a bit of the grind away by doing the things like the GitHub automation or automatically determining which pieces of the code or uh, which files in a in a certain module needed to uh, needed to change. Uh, we also ran into uh, we also ran into some very specific edge cases that we uh, that we had to work around. And the edge cases are often where uh, where automation stops. So, for example, uh, one of uh, one of the things that happened for us was uh, instead of an endpoint moving from one version to another uh, version, a number of endpoints uh, got moved over to an entire different uh, different tree. And then, for for that specific edge case, we would have to. Uh, built uh, built specific uh, if else statements just to determine uh, correctly uh, correctly assert what uh, what had happened there. And then also when a new fun functionality gets introduced, if the functionality goes into a new endpoint, there might actually not be a breaking a breaking change, but it would still warrant an update uh, to the SDKs because. Uh, not all the functionality might be available. Uh, the old endpoint will still be functional, but uh, as soon as new uh, new functions are used, uh, new functionality is used, uh, our objects can't be queried using the older endpoints. So then it becomes important to uh, to build the logic for that and integrate that into our uh, into our SDKs. And then the, the fifth uh, obviously relies a, a lot on the automation to integrate it into our processes and how we, uh, how we do our work. So uh, our processes, uh, what I mentioned before, was having the automated, uh, the automated issues on GitHub and being able to, uh, to take the information from the, different, uh, from the different SDKs and integrations and to be able to uh, uh, to give ourselves uh, reports and uh, automated uh, automated steps to simplify our workflow and eventually resulting into having to do less work whenever we're uh, updating or maintaining uh, our SDKs or integrations. And with that, I think I'm uh, going to hit the 20 minutes almost on the dot. I would uh, like to open it up to questions. Uh, if for whatever reason I don't get to your question uh, to your question right away, I'm also on Twitter and I'm quite responsive there, so you can always tag me in there. And I think my DMs are open, and if they're not, then uh, just tweet at me, and I'll make sure they're open. Okay, so thank you, Jab. Uh, maybe just if you can check that uh, the camera is allowed, so maybe we can see you for the Q and A. Yep. Maybe we can solve the problem. Yes. In a few seconds. Um, so indeed, API evolutions. It's yeah, it's a very complicated topic. Uh, we never know what happens. Um, you told us about your report that explains what are the modifications. Uh, do you use uh, your own homemade format or something else or? How what, how do looks these reports? What 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 what, uh, what you put in them? Are they machine readable or just text reports? Uh, so um, we generate reports internally as uh, as 
structured objects. So um, my preferred output is uh, to output it as a markdown file because it's uh, that's easiest to read. Uh, by the way, I've tried to fix my camera, but it says all cameras are uh, unavailable in this uh, in this browser. So not sure what happened there. Um, uh, but we have different kind of outputs because once we have it to Markdown, we can uh, we can convert it to PDF, we can make an HTML report, uh, or we can just dump it as JSON so we can parse it and mm -hmm. then use it in an automated pipeline to uh, uh, to work with it further. Great, and uh, the uh, for the analysis. Uh, to check if there are differences. Uh, did you have to run different strategies? Um, uh, do, you on, you, do you only rely on uh, the open API specifications or also on maybe runtime, difference at runtime? Um, so most of our work is based on the open, I, uh, open API uh, specifications. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the, the biggest, uh, uh, our, our biggest input. But uh, for the edge cases, then uh, either I still manually go to, uh, uh, manually go to the, the change flow, or uh, I access the engineering documentation to figure out how a certain feature or how a certain endpoint is, uh, is designed. And also to, de to determine how that should be, uh, should be implemented in our, uh, in our SDKs. So it's a combination of things, but our uh, primary input is the open API spec. And for the open API spec comparison, do you use an existing library or did you start from scratch? Uh, no, I started out with existing libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, the disadvantage of that is that with the existing libraries, we would end up with uh, a similar output that we had uh, uh, that we had from our from our change logs, it shows all the changes, and it also didn't. Uh, it, it, uh, for us, it wasn't directly actionable information. Mm -hmm. So I ended up uh, rewriting a lot of that and creating our own uh, our own framework for that that worked with uh, with our API spec, uh, and with uh, and also to account for the differences in the internal uh, the internal uh, APIs, the V1, the V2s to make sure that we also do a comparison between those mm -hmm. rather than just looking at the exact API endpoint if they exist uh, in the new version. OK, there is a question from Rudy Battleness. In case of new functionalities, do you also include adding documentation in your workflow? Uh, so the documentation for the API endpoints is always supplied uh, whenever a new uh, new endpoint is created. So the documentation is always there. Mm -hmm. uh, once we integrate it into uh, into our SDKs, then we'll make sure that we have uh, specific examples for those SDKs of how to use the new functionality and uh, or a sample command that uh, that can be done. Okay. I think we're done. 